Our purpose is to reason. That was actually Socrates, one of our an ancient philosophers' conclusion on the question of what is the purpose of humans. It's a pretty convenient conclusion for a professional thinker, by the way, but his definition and reason to believe, to believe so is that for ex he, th he thought that um, each species' uh, purpose comes from its unique capability. For example, the birds, they have a unique capability of flying, so therefore their purpose is to fly. Fishes, they can swim uh, in water and breathe in water, so therefore their purpose is to be in the sea and swim. Humans, they can reason. Therefore, that has to be our purpose. I would want to add to that that reasoning and thinking logically without action is actually um, pointless. And one should always question how and why uh, humans take the actions that we do. But the point of the matter is that we are the only ones who constantly, throughout these years that we have been on this planet, have reasoned and then taken action on our reasoning. For example, we can't really prove that the lions or the zebras in the African savanna can't reason as good as we can. But what we do can show is that they're doing the same things that they have been doing for the last hundred years or last thousand years, while us humans, we have changed ourselves, changed our behavior. And I would obviously emphasize that it's not always that we take action and reason for the best, but this constant thinking and taking new action is what has brought us to where we are today. And the question of taking action and why we take action is actually something that is interesting. And in my experience, after doing some work for NASA at Johnson Space Center, mainly towards Mars missions, I really understood why we humans push ourselves to find new solutions. When you look at the Mars mission, which basically has the aim to colonize Mars and make it able for us to live there and use it as a second home planet, you instantly realize that all the things we associate with living on Earth and the behaviors we have created and the behavioral patterns we have created for uh, living on Earth, we simply cannot do when we think of living on Mars. So we have to think again and we have to come up with new solutions. Basically what we also today refer as innovations. So just to give you an idea of how extreme it can be going to Mars, regardless if it's 30 days or 100 days or 200 days based on which transportation technology you use, you actually have to transport yourself in outer space to this new planet. And if you just think about being in a pressurized capsule, what is actually the home going there, if you want to do a very simple thing like reading a book, you would have to find your, obviously you would start off with all the things you do in, that you do on Earth. You would make a, find a comfortable place where you think that you will spend the next 15 minutes or half an hour spending uh, time reading a book. But the first thing that you have to think about is that you will have to make sure that the air circulation in the capsule is good, otherwise, you can just suffocate and pass out because if you don't make sure that the air outside of your nose and mouth isn't streaming and it's not circulating enough, you will just breathe and create your own carbon dioxide bubble. And this is just one of the extreme examples of how different it is. What I also realized, uh, being engaged in creating new solutions for the Mars uh, mission, that when you look at a new place to live, regardless of if it's an apartment, if it's a flat, a bungalow, or a new planet, before you move in, you actually have the possibility of really evaluate and see the potential of that apartment or habitat or planet, instead of just being there and doing what you have always done. So I decided to look on Earth not as an insider, but as an outsider looking at its future home. And when you look on Earth and look on our most important resource, water, you will see some pretty horrific facts. For example, of all of the water we have on Earth, more than 97% of that water is salt water. 
And salt water by its character is very costly and energy demanding for us to purify so we can use it in our everyday lives. Out of the 3% that is fresh water, more than 2% is locked in ice near our poles. And that water we actually don't want to have melt because the implication on having the seawater levels rise is way worse uh, than getting access to the fresh water. So we actually have less than 1% fresh water that we can use in our everyday life. And if you look at how we use water on Earth, more than two-thirds goes to agriculture, which is pretty natural because we need the crops with a growing population, and the more we increase our living standards, we want to have more food and more uh, vegetables for everybody to have. Then we have 20% that goes to industry, which is the same, with the same reason of having a growing population with, with more access to healthcare, more ac access to pharma and medicals. We need water in order to process uh, these uh, commodities. So it's actually only 10% of the fresh water and water on Earth that we are touching on an everyday basis. All the water you're drinking, all the water you're cleaning yourself with comes from the 10% pool, uh, which is pretty interesting based on the fact that we only have 1% fresh water of all the water. So looking at how we spend water in Europe, for example, an average person uses 200 liters of water per day, whereas sanitation and hygiene takes the biggest part of more than 30% of that. Then we ha use roughly 40 liters, 50 liters for washing our laundry. We have some water going to the toilet and the taps in the home. And what I realized when I looked at how we use water uh, on Earth and what the actual availability of water is, I set out to create a company which I founded a couple of years ago called Orbital Systems with a mission to create a new paradigm in daily water usage. If you look at the actual problem with, for example, the most water consuming application we have in our homes, the shower, you see that we have a linear use of water. For example, after one minute, we have used more than 10 liters of water. After two minutes, it's 20, three minutes, 30, four minutes, 40. After five minutes, we've used more than 50 liters of water, 10 minutes, 100. And at the same time, we have more than two billion people lacking access to adequate sanitation. So it's a pretty extreme way of using water. By the way, you have to think about that most people prefer to shower in body temperature which means that you have to heat the water before you flush it out the drain. So the solution which we call using water in an orbital way, that's having a closed loop system. So after one minute you use five liters of water, after two minutes still five, three minutes five liters. Basically, after five minutes you have still used the same amount of water. After 10 minutes still five, you can even shower 20 minutes with five liters of water. So it's a completely different way of using water for sanitation. Here we have an example of a shower cabin where we have built in the technology in the floor of that shower cabin. So it's actually not seen by, the, uh, by people using it. So when you have and you face a big challenge, one of the advantages of m chopping it up in parts and focusing on one part, one application, is that you can really narrow it down and make sure that, that you can perfect that. So the benefits of attacking the shower application this way is that you can, you can get very straightforward benefits. For example, you have the water saving aspect. We can save more than 90% of the water. But you also can make sure that you isolate the whole hygienic problem and purify the water in such, to such levels that it's actually cleaner than regular hot water pipes. Uh, where you can find a lot of Legionnaires bacteria, for example. But also because it's an independently working application and not connected to the rest of the house, you can make sure that you can have a pump that has a better water pressure and water flow than what you otherwise would find in a uh, shower. So we have done more than hundreds of these installations across the world. And for those of you living in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, we have it in some bathing establishments that I would obviously recommend you to go. We have one in Malmo, and actually the biggest one in Denmark has our uh, shower technology. Um, so going back to how we use water, we start with attacking the showers. 
by just changing out the showers in the home or adding this technology to it, we we'll go from 200 liters a day to 130 liters a day per person. This is the first step in our master plan. The second step is to introduce more applications that go direct recycling and closing the loop in the home. The final one, when we have done this, is to integrate them as if we were to be in a space capsule. For example, after you have used five liters of water in the shower, instead of flushing that out, you can use that water for flushing the toilet. And after you have used 15 liters of water in a washing machine, why not use some of that for irrigation? Why not use some of that for flushing the toilet? And by doing so, we suddenly have a much better way of using our resources. And that 10% pool, pool of that 1% pool suddenly is accessible for more than 10 times the population. Thank you. <laughs>